Welcome everybody to the 18th year that we've been doing this event in memory of Will. It's hard to believe it's been 18 years since he passed. 18 years on Thursday. Anyway, I am not doing the introduction, although it may appear like I am. Um, I am just here because I wanted to look at all of you and see an audience and see so many wonderful people out there that I haven't seen in more than three years because we haven't met in this format for three years. We sort of did the last time, but um, we now actually have the speaker with us. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we invite you to the table at the back of the room where you came in. We have the book that Kali has uh, co-edited on the table. Um, We're selling it, I think, for $10. OK, yes, at a very reduced price. Um, and all of the proceeds from the book are going to the organization that Kali works for and with, Cooperation Jackson, as well as the, um, the lecture series is giving a donation as well. So if people could turn their phones off um, or quiet them, without further ado, Joy, We'll do the introduction. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing, sorry. T-shirts. We have an abundance of these. They are actually 18 years old. Mm -hmm. They're almost antiques. And um, we still have so many of them. We would just like to give them to you. So there's a bunch on the table back there. And if you don't find one now, we'll have some more for you at the next lecture. Um, and this one is for Kali. Hello all, my name is Joy Mazahre, and I am a second year English student at UVM, a master's student, and I'm a Fulbright scholar from Amman, Jordan. Welcome to the Spring Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series. We are very happy that you are joining us today. This series is dedicated to Will Miller, Vermont's lifelong social justice activist and University of Vermont philosophy professor for 35 years. After a brave battle with cancer, Will Miller has passed in 2005. Anne Lipset, Will's partner, founded this series as a continuation of his legacy of speaking truth to power and his commitment to the struggle against injustice. Thank you, Anne, for keeping Will's voice alive. You can learn more about the Will Miller Association and the remembrance of his impactful change on willmiller.org. Like the logo says, he will always be remembered as a voice in a world of false words and disinformation. It is my honor and pleasure tonight to welcome Kali Akuno to Burlington, Vermont, to speak on shifting focus, organizing for an eco-socialist future. Day by day, capitalism chokes life systems on our planet and threatens the existence of complex species, including the human race. Eco-socialism offers transformation from below, employs an economy of solidarity, and prioritizes voices and principles of decolonization, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, anti-racism, anti-heterosexism, and degrowth in the face of global health, economic, and climate crises. The development of an eco-economic democracy and the building of a solidarity economy are the core of Kali Akuna's life, work, and activism. Kali is an activist, organizer, educator, and writer. He is also the co-editor of Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi, and more recently, Jackson Rising Redux, lesson, Lessons on Building the Future in the Present. Although rooted in ideological conversations and frameworks, Kali insists on the dynamic nature of social justice and its efforts in addressing oppressive systems by aligning theory with practice. 
So Kali is also the co-founder and director of Cooperative Cooperation Jackson, an emerging vehicle that aims to develop a cooperative network to achieve sustainable community development and ownership based in Jackson, Mississippi. When I first learned about Cooperation Jackson, I stared at their logo for a very long time. In my personal research and stance against injustice, I derive lessons from my grandmother's stories as I look back into the past in order to act in the present and see hope in the future. I found the same thing in Cooperation Jackson's logo. It features three wisdom symbols used by the Asante people in Ghana to recall virtues and values of traditional life. If you look at the logo, it incorporates three adinkra or wisdom symbols. At the center, bua, mina, mi, mua, wo, or help me and let me help you, as a symbol of cooperation and interdependence. On the left, in konson, konson, in unity lies strength. And on the right, wo, nsa, da, mua, meaning if your hands are in the dish, people do not eat everything and leave you nothing, which explains the importance of participation in self-government. I encourage you to visit cooperationjackson.org to learn more about Kali's work in his community. Special thanks to our sponsors and the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series board members, Lionel Beasley, Ron Jacobs, Isaac Kriesman, Fred Magdoff, Anne Peterman, Helen Scott, and Anne Lipset. Please help, come, help me welcome Kali Akuna on stage. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can folks hear me? Okay, let me put this away. Um, first, um, I really want to honor the t-shirt and um, a little anecdotal story that I just learned on the car ride uh, over here that, that makes me feel that me and Will are uh, kindred spirits. I don't buy t-shirts. I, I don't buy that many clothes to begin with and I kind of wear them until they literally just fall apart. But I have, I would argue, uh, an amazing t-shirt collection, right? From uh, social struggles and movements from all over the world. And it's my understanding, Will did too, right? And that uh, he, like every protest and everything, that he had a t-shirt collection. And when, when Fred was telling me this in the car, I just started laughing uh, because, you know, my uh, mom and partner recently in the middle of the pandemic co-conspired to take two of my drawers of T-shirts without my permission, cut them up, and they've been trying to make a quilt, right, They're like of all these different things. So I'm waiting to see what the quilt looks like. I'm mad that I'm like a little bit more shirtless, but I have like hundreds of them. So, uh, so it, was, it was fitting to get another one. <laughs> In his honor, right? So uh, I want to deeply appreciate uh, that uh, in honor of his memory. Uh, the other thing before getting started, um, want to give a, a shout out to you know the workers who are on strike uh, a little bit up the road, or what? No, east of here, I guess east and up the road uh, over at Goddard College. Um, hopefully everybody, you know, is in some active and constructive solidarity with them in their uh, efforts, uh, since it's not that far from you all. Uh, we need more workers' power. And to that vein, as someone who is uh, pushing for workers' ownership uh, in any and all forms, um, you know, maybe be in some dialogue about shifting uh, the college into more of a collective worker-owned space. Right, so just a little, yes, uh, just a little something to, to drop on you and, and, and to interject. That's something for the workers to decide themselves, but you know, just try to plant a few seeds here or there. Um, now for this, for, for tonight, I'm, a, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. Uh, like I'm a, I'm a kind of speaker, I hate PowerPoints. 
Um, and I kind of hate prescripted stuff. And I'm usually the kind of person who, um, you know, with, with my social analytical skills, however right or wrong they may be, I try to read, you know, who's in the audience and what they're there for and speak directly to you um, to the greatest extent that I can and learn as much from you as, as what I have to share. I'm still going to try to do that a little bit, but in a more scripted format. So if it's a little bit more boring than usual, uh, just bear with me. Uh, that is not my style. And what I want to do with that uh, is really make an argument, right? A particular type of argument. Because uh, there's two things, let me lay out, that I really want to accomplish. Number one, as the title says, shifting focus. So there's an argument about um, that title is an argument with, with us, with the less, with the left, right? And the creatures of the left, of which I'm assuming most of you are. Uh, and there's an argument that I think there's some things that uh, we both, on, on the one hand, don't analyze enough, B, that we take for granted, and C, that we accept the terms too often that, that our enemies lay out for us and fight on their terrain. So that is... The first set of things is just to lay an argument out and start an argument and dialogue. Hopefully that's, that's generative, right, that we can have. Uh, the second piece is to kind of lay out, um, we are calling it a formula because we don't think it's fully articulated yet enough to be kind of a coherent program, but it's aiming in that direction. And the argument uh, about that we want to elicit is to generate enough thought and common collective that we can start developing a broader program together, right? So we, we feel much more comfortable, this we being Cooperation Jackson, and call it a little bit of a formula than a program so that there's something we want to articulate. And I want to lay out those two things, like in short order. I'm, I'm not going to try to take too long so we can actually have conversation. And if I tried, it would actually probably take a couple of days to really lay out. No joke. Um, but the first part of this, all right, so the shifting focus part of this. Um, now, there's an essay myself and, and two other comrades uh, wrote that has this title. came out 2001, and we've been struggling with part two since that time. Uh, it's, it's coming for those of you who might be interested. And the, the, the article itself, I think if you read it carefully, you see that we don't, we're not all in agreement on every particular point, like the three of us who wrote that. We have a lot of internal debates, particularly on how we are uh, interpreting history. And some of that's because we come from uh, similar influences, but also profoundly different influences. So these two comrades in particular were most heavily influenced, you know, come out of the, uh, the Maoist uh, movements, you know, of the late 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, I come from a much more revolutionary nationalist, but socialist in form and content kind of orientation from the, the cadre organization and things that I was a part of. And you see some of those differences reflective, but I think they're generative enough. Uh, that I think we're asking some of the right questions and, one to, and taking certain positions. So one of the things that we are really challenging we want to offer to, to folks uh, is number one, first piece, um, we, and this is the broad left, and by the left, let me be very clear for the record, what I mean, you may mean something different, but you know, to set out terms, uh, the left to me means anarchists, Socialists, communists, revolutionary nationalists, and certain forms of indigenous articulations around self-determination or sovereignty. And that's a broad scope. It doesn't include everybody or everyone, but it also doesn't exclude. Uh, and so within that, I'm very specifically not talking about liberals, per se, or, or certain types of progressives, just to be very clear. Uh, and why? Right, because there's certain fundamental challenges that I think the left has to uphold. Number one, it has to be very clear on its stance relative to capitalism and imperialism without fundamental challenge. And if you're not about the abolishment of those two things, I'm not quite sure 
what you are really about talking about you on the left. Now, there's other things that, you know, we, and we are split amongst those things amongst ourselves, let's be clear, what they mean, what they articulated. Uh, but for us coming from our position, we also like, like the more revolutionary nationalist position, as it relates to the United States, is getting some broad agreement, or at least trying to understand, that the project that you are living on, called the United States government, is a settler colonial project, right? And that it fundamentally has no legitimacy. Now, what you derive from that is what this shifting focus, particular, the first argument is about. Like, we have too much of a reliance on uh, the frameworks, the ideologically, I'm talking about the left, around bourgeois democracy. So I'm asking you to shift focus on how you relate to bourgeois democracy, right? And why? The why is perhaps most important. A lot of our arguments, particularly of late, since the left has been so out of position and so unorganized for, for a good minute now, um, we get trapped in these notions around and arguments around, we need to preserve democracy. And we need to fight for democracy. By which people mean bourgeois democracy. Without necessarily recognizing or taking into account, I would argue, the history of, of oppressed people, the history of subaltern subjects, the history of folks who've been colonized and exploited the world over, that the argument that we kind of articulate by, with this position is we act as if bourgeois democracy has been the global norm. Now, I want you all to think about that. We act as if bourgeois democracy has been the global norm. Has it been? That's a question. No. Most folks on the planet have never experienced bourgeois democracy. None of the last 200 years. A, the good chunk of that, most of us were colonial subjects or direct slaves, property of Europeans. Uh, and so we're only incorporated into that, that, this game or this, this framework uh, as, oppressed subject to, as oppressed subjects. Not something that we directly had access to. And we spent a good deal of the late 19th century and the 20th century, right, with the national liberation movements fighting to be incorporated into the bourgeois world, right? So if you look at all the, the Ghana to, you know, uh, uh, Algeria to uh, Vietnam, you know, uh, I can go on and on, right? Trying to construct national uh, uh, entities, these nation states, as part of a decolonial, a version of a decolonial program, but the, the piece was to be incorporated into the world system that, that the bourgeois order had created. But the reality of the situation was, if we look back, the underscore of that is this, this argument that bourgeois democracy and capitalism kind of go hand in hand, right? At least I was presented to me and you, and that they need each other. That's a complete farce, a complete farce. Right? Capitalism has never needed bourgeois democracy to function. Didn't start with bourgeois democracy, and clearly it's probably not going to end with any, you know, sarcosant respect for bourgeois democracy. And why that's critical is because we'd wind up getting trapped in certain arguments around, like, defending this project and defending democracy, which winds up leading to a kind of a lesser than evil politics and pursuit. Right? And so we kind of like forestall actually fighting for revolutionary objectives for incremental things to like save as much space and protect as much democratic space as we possibly can. Not that that's not necessary, but does it leave room in our imaginations to think of ourselves as like the democratic subjects I think, you know, the, I'll just use like Marx in particular was thinking like the pursuit of democracy and the left being the champions of democracy, as we argue in the paper, does not mean we need to accept bourgeois democracy or bourgeois order or any of its institutions, right? We have the ability to create our own, and we have the ability to engage and subvert those that exist, and we need to do both at the same time. Like that is our argument, okay? So that's the shifting focus part. There's much more to say on that, but that's the shifting focus part. The other part of this is kind of the argument, like the formula kind of aspects of it, is, okay, if I accept your position, then what, what do I do? 
you know, what do I do? Uh, I'm one who argues um, the left being out of position does not mean that it's actually out of power. It just requires us to, again, to shift focus and to think in some profoundly different ways. And I would argue that we do have a crisis of democracy, not a crisis of bourgeois democracy. We have a crisis of small d democracy amongst ourselves, right? And I would argue that if you actually look the comprehensive sense of all the different potentially left-leaning projects and things that we are involved in just within this country, it is profound. We are doing a lot of work. But it's not connected, right? It's not united, right? We don't talk to each other enough. We don't plan with each other enough. We don't coordinate with each other enough. And we're definitely not organized. But I bet you, like, and I don't, I don't know Burlington in this particular way, but I bet you there's like probably more than 15 uh, community organizing projects around agriculture right here in this city. Am I wrong? Like different kind of community gardens and things of that nature? It's probably more than 15 of them, right? Do y'all really plan and coordinate with each other? Huh? Oh, that's, that's, that's an issue. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's some problems there. Um, but I see a bunch of, which means no, <laughs> right? Like there's some dialogue. Uh, there may be some, you know, inter interchange of knowledge, but you're not planting in accordance with each other. You're not thinking about how do we meet the actual caloric needs of the people in Burlington, right? And it's more kind of a side activity than it is can this be a central activity that actually meets the social needs. And if it was more of a central activity that met the social needs, right, you can probably create new relations of production based upon that, which then remove people from having to do so much extraneous wage labor. Not completely eliminated, not by itself, but it changes the dynamic, I would argue, if that was coordinated. Now, just multiply that amongst all the other different things that we're doing. And how many people are actually involved in all these projects? It's a lot. It's a lot. But we're not organized. That's why we're out of position. We're not organized. But the practices that, that we are engaged in in a broad particular way, if they could be organized, could be potentially transformative. Not necessarily in itself. You're going to have to have other kind of inputs. But our argument is, and this is something that we drew in particular from like our analysis of uh, what happened in COVID. And let me just back up a little bit to say what I mean. Uh, uh, I would argue that in real time, you know, all of us were alive three years ago. And I think we witnessed some profound shifts that maybe not lasted that long, but we witnessed some things that if you step back and you look at the arguments we've been living with the last 25, 30 years, some of them even longer than that. And what we've been told consistently by the nation states, by all the multilateral institutions, the US, I mean, the global economy is too large, too profound, too complex for there to be immediate shifts, right, to eliminate carbon or to reduce carbon emissions and all these other kind of dangerous emissions, right? So it's not even worth asking for like a hard radical stop. You're not gonna get it. That's what they told us and been telling us since 1992. What did we all live through in February, March, April, May of 2020? They stopped it. Right, they ground it to a halt. We're not doing a whole bunch of trade. You know, ships was out in the ocean, you know, for months on end, right? Wouldn't allow them into ports. There was a period, you know, was it, you know, and that wasn't, you know, totally associated with COVID, but at the same time, y'all remember, oil was so cheap that they were giving it away. 
the oil companies were paying people to take oil from them off their hands because there was so much of a glut and the price had dropped. And so that was just one of these living moments where you stop and step back and like, wait a minute, y'all been completely lying the whole time. <laughs> I mean, we already know, but, but to, to see it in real time is something else. When you stop and think about it, it's like, wait a minute, if there's political will, we can actually move on some of this pretty quickly and pretty profoundly. We just witnessed it, right? And other things that they said, like, oh, you know, you'll never, it's too complex, it's too big, it's too, you know, unwieldy to try to do. We all witness a, a, a type of, a, of, not everywhere, not uniform, but we live through a kind of a mini universal basic income experiment for a year and a half, right? And the US economy didn't collapse, right? It probably actually saved it for at least for a while, right? And it was so threatening to a certain degree that, you know, what the Republicans and some of the Democrats started losing their minds after about six months. It's like, look, no, we gotta stop this because us giving these, you know, uh, uh, benefits out is undermining people returning to work because they're making, they're getting more money off of these benefits than they were from actually working, right? Which they said that the wages are so low and the conditions that people will come back. And then what was the after effect of that? Part of it, the consciousness that happened somewhat spontaneously, people just stopped going to work, right? Or at least stopped working for wages, you know, that was subpar. And the thing I like to say is, you know, being part of the Fight for 15 campaign in Jackson for a long, long time, the pandemic got in six months what we couldn't do in 10 years. Like quickly, I remember going to, the, to uh, uh, one of the local stores and seeing in the window, we'll pay $20 an hour <laughs> and with benefits. This is in Mississippi where there, there basically is no, no real you know, wage control or, or you know, uh, what do we call it? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, minimum wage. There really is no minimum wage. And they don't offer no benefits to nobody, right? This is a Taft Hartley state regime to the fullest. And, and uh, you know, right to work literally means the right to like work to death. Uh, and it's such a matter to see how un, un, uh, uneven it is. If you just look at certain migration patterns, it gives you a sense of the level of the super exploitation that still exists in Mississippi. Mississippi does not have a large Latino or, or immigrant migrant population in it. And it's mainly an agricultural state. Now ask yourself why. Primary reason they can still like, super exploit citizen based black labor at such a cheap rate that they don't need to bring in other people. Like we got the cheap labor force we need right here. Why bring in somebody else? And we can do to them basically the same thing we do to people who don't have papers. If they get out of line, I can put their ass in jail, not pay them. Since they depend upon me, I can get them off their farms. Or they, that's still the case in Mississippi. Right? And if you've been following some of the news, you'll see some of that still at play. Like how they're basically, uh, as I was telling somebody else, I want y'all to understand before I leave here why I'm going on this. So by the end of this legislative session, which happens in a week and a half, uh, at least in Jackson, Structurally, we will be back in 1954. And I'm not joking with you, I'm not being hyperbolic. Like apartheid is really being legislated back into existence in Jackson, Mississippi. There'll be a black Bantu style, which will have no resources. And then there'll be a, the, the white majority area will have control over a city within a city that's not elected, it's totally controlled by the governor, that will have all the resources, that they directly control, and then institute an occupying you know, police force that it controls the whole city. Right? That is basically what we, what we are going to have. So folks, be, be clear about that. That's what's being instituted. And that's a precursor of basically what's coming. So, um, so drawing from those lessons, this was the point. Drawing from those kind of lessons of seeing like these profound shifts one of the things that made us really, we were, you know, uh, and for us, you know, we tried to do it during the pandemic to make it clear. During the pandemic, we tried to do, uh, luckily we we're internationally connected to, you know, some good folks. And so, you know, if y'all remember first it was China, then it was Italy and Iran. Those were the first two that really got hit outside of China with the pandemic. 
at least that they were talk, telling him about. And comrades in Italy initially were saying, oh, it's just a bad flu. Then a week later, they would say, no, it's worse. Stop, we were wrong. Because uh, we were trying to learn from him, like, well, how are you guys dealing with providing mutual aid? So we were trying to get ourselves here, and they told us, stop. You're not, if you don't have the personal you know, protective equipment, if you don't have the PPE, stop what you're doing. People are getting sick. People are dying. Our people are dying. Stop what you're doing. We took that lesson and we stopped. So we were trying to figure out, well, what can we do? Right? What can we do? We figured some things out. But the thing that, that was most, you know, just speaking person, that was most illuminating to me was to see the explosion of mutual aid work that actually did take place throughout the country during that period. And that said to me that neoliberalism, which I think, you know, neoliberalism, in my view, and we can argue about this, its most successful piece has been its cultural penetration and its cultural acceptance, not just all the things that's privatized and dismantled. But as a cultural project, it has been highly successful, right? And that was the piece that's most concerning that I think will live, you know, well beyond uh, uh, whatever little welfare-oriented tweaks they might want to try to do, which is what Biden was elected to do and what he said he was going to try to do. That worked, but that's what he said he was going to try to do. But that demonstrated it hasn't been as far-reaching or as penetrating that, as I thought. But what it, what it revealed was a number of different like, like challenges, I think, that we've been, been trying to search with, like our, our old problems of the old kind of 20th century uh, uh, variants of state socialism that you know, had tremendous problems, right? Particularly trying to assess demand and actually, you know, do any kind of planning and development from below, which they didn't do and they didn't do well, right? Let's just be real about that. And so, like, this was a, 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 an instance of people responding to real need in real time in their communities, right? And and meeting a certain level of need uh, and fulfilling, it, right? Through just totally decentralized planning. Right? Totally decentralized planning. But planning to a certain extent, at least on the community level, you know, well. And we saw at a certain point, I think, was like in particularly in the, the Midwest, you know, there were a lot of farmers who were just, just stop selling, you know, shifting to the market. A in part because it was cut off. But like they were just taking stuff directly to food centers and food banks and then setting up distribution centers and, and meeting kind of aggregate need and doing a certain level of planning on a couple of them based upon what people need. So that kind of need and demand was and kind of orientation was being met in a very decentralized way. And for, for me, we were trying to argue with people then, we, we helped to form this coalition called People Strike, you know, trying to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and this lesson just seemed to be kind of being missed by a lot of people that we were in, in relationship with. And part of it, we were trying to talk to a lot of labor unions, because y'all remember there was a little strike wave that was happening at that particular point in time, right? Some of it before, uh, um, the pandemic kind of really kicked off, but then a lot of the, like some of the chicken workers in uh, Alabama and Georgia, they started picking up very early on and then it kind of picked up. So you know, it's like, look, we have two sets of responses going on that if they were coordinated, could be very powerful. And we were saying it could move us in the direction, not necessarily immediately, but move us in the direction of a general strike. Mm -hmm and that the potential and capacity was there. And we were saying this and arguing this and people striking articulated, if people want to go back and look at some of that, before the George Floyd Rebellion took off and jumped off. So it brings us back to that central point. Like if we were really organized and connected, we could be extremely powerful. But that's not how we look at ourselves. Right, that's not how we look at ourselves. Like we look at all these things as like little fragmented eruptions that we're not connected to and don't connect the dots. So we're saying with this formula, let's connect the dots. And the first piece that we said we want to, you know, really articulate and lift up, and it, it, there's a piece if you see it that's on our website. There's a little this formula that's kind of written up there, and I'm only going to talk about four or five of them very quickly. Uh, um, the first one is mutual aid, right? Uh, and we, we start with that one primarily uh, because that is what a great many of us are actually doing and doing on a sustained basis throughout. And this is from, like, look, this is from a materialist orientation and what we're first trying to look at is where and how are people already organized? 
right? It's different than like, let me convince you to do something. I'm like, no, where are people already organized? What are people already doing? Like, it, and the question is, how do we then build the democratic practices to connect? And we have to deal with, like, let's be real, we gotta deal with a crisis of trust, us trusting each other on the left, which we don't do that well. We gotta deal with a crisis of imagination, we gotta deal with a crisis of confidence, and we gotta deal with a crisis of vision. So that's what, with these type of things are what we're trying to articulate. So the piece we're talking about with mutual aid, imagine connecting that, because it has weaknesses. Like one of the big weaknesses of a lot of our mutual aid work that we articulate, like I'll just put it this way in terms of being quick. A lot of our mutual aid is dependent upon gifts, right? Or minor appropriations, one or the other. Neither of which are sustainable, right? Because let's say the cupboard runs out, then we can't distribute anything. So what is it missing? It's missing connection to the productive capacity of the working class. And that is what one of the next pieces really tries to address. So, so the next piece in that formula is food sovereignty, right? And trying to be very clear for and mindful of connecting these two things, right? And trying to get folks who are involved in the mutual aid work to take food production a little bit more seriously and divert some time and energy into that on a local level, starting in both urban, suburban, and rural pieces, and then try to think of it within, you know, what we call like your bio region to develop mm -hmm. some capacity within that region first and foremost to be able to develop a real program of, of food sovereignty that's directly connected to the demand and, and, and oriented responses coming out of all the information that's being gathered by the folks who are doing the mutual aid work. Like how do we determine what people actually need? The mutual aid is a part of that can, if articulated in a particular way, begin to answer some of those questions. Right? And it's a way also of trying to, of, from largely, you know, be real, a defensive uh, uh, piece down the road, it's a way of trying to deal with some of the major urban and rural divides that exist within the United States political project at present. Right? And what do I mean by that? Go look at the 2016 and 2020 electoral maps. Right? You know, it's just a point of evidence. Right, so the Democrats basically can only count on, on urban areas for any base of sustained support. But the rest of the map is red, and not the red of the good kind. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's you know, the, the, the land mass of what the Republicans can control is pretty overwhelming. And as an organized strategy, I think one of the only ways the left is going to overcome that is by building their own, you know, urban to rural strategy that's linked in these particular ways. Right, so that's a component to look in there. Now, food sovereignty, mutual aid, not enough. Not nearly enough. So the other piece that's, that's central to this, if you look in the, 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 the version that we got to redo it, we initially said cooperative economics. This normal, we, we got that wrong. We got that wrong. It's, it's a short change for what we actually want to say, which is worker self-organization. Worker self-organization is a major third component. And this is where in particular, yes, we have to be doing broader work to create, create more cooperatives, particularly working cooperatives anywhere and everywhere, right, to cover all different kind of areas. But there's another piece of why I was saying worker self-organization. Look, um, union density in this country is, is declining rapidly and union power declining. Uh, and their model, I would dare say, is, is somewhat fundamentally obsolete. And I'm just gonna make that argument, somewhat fundamentally obsolete. Uh, in the sense that, you know, it's oriented by the bounds and what people have accepted, this goes back to the first part, of what we have learned to kind of accept within the framework of the National Liberations Act, the National Labor Relations Act, by right, accepting those terms about what we can fight for as workers, right, and what we can't. Like how we can't be in solidarity with other workers, we can't be involved in political strikes or political action. Like we need, that's one of those things that, that shifting folks, crap all that. Believing in it is a limitation. It's a complete limitation that we bought into, right? And it worked for about 25, 30 years. That period has long been over. Get rid of that, right? And 
move out of that. Because now, if, if look, there's only 10% of, of what's considered like the working class anyway, why hold on to it? You know, well, most people tell you because of the resources and the structures, okay, I, I don't want to get rid of that, but I know it's not sufficient either to do what we need to do. So the one of the pieces that we've been pushing for is we need to be encouraging all the different forms of, of worker self-organization that we particularly can with a very class-centered project orientation, including what we have kind of developed and trying to articulate is like we need to be building not co-ops for co-op sake, but class struggle or class conscious oriented, you know, co-ops. Which is different than how most co-ops are articulated. Most co-ops are articulated within a very entrepreneurial kind of framework, which leaves them kind of isolated to only dealing with their members and the benefits of their members and not being in solidarity with other workers. So much so that a lot of the literature was to say, well, co-ops will survive economic crisis because they can shift their own wages. So, well, okay, the fact that we can exploit ourselves greater than what the market will bear should not be something that should be praised, right? In a time of crisis, we need to be figuring how do we organize more people, right? Not how do we retreat more, more inward to deal with it. But that's part of this orientation even about co-ops that has to change. Like if they're gonna be to any way or any form instruments that's, that enable us to do any kind of revolutionary activity. But on the corresponding end, right, um, uh, hopefully, you know, I was just in uh, UMass, Amherst, and did a presentation with uh, uh, Chris Smalls. Um, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to get up when I saw that and kind of do this weird schedule that I'm on now was to make a particular intervention and say, okay, look, what y'all doing on Amazon and what folks are doing at, at you know, all the coffee shops, and that's, that's cool, but if it's just about better wages, better working conditions in the contract, I would argue that's not what we need, right? I'm not telling you not to do that, but I want to encourage y'all, particularly like the Amazon, like, can y'all think about actually taking over Amazon? given the behemoth that it is, like interject that into your thinking and start planning for it now. And let's figure out those of us who are like the consumers or not of Amazon, how do we act in solidarity with them to totally take this over and make it, you know, a social and collective utility. It's gonna be hard as hell to do, don't get me wrong. But if we don't think about it, it definitely won't ever come to pass. It's not gonna just organize itself in that particular way, right? So to interject in that particular way. So that's why this component is about, we have to do a, a certain level of just promote working class self-organization for all these things to be tied together with the pursuit, right, of democratizing, socializing and democratizing the means of production. That has to be the goal. Not just like better working conditions and wages. But without that goal, it doesn't mean anything. Like the goal is how do we do that, right? And we're in a weird period where there, there, there's kind of two dimensions that, well really three dimensions that have to happen at once. One, uh, in a community like mine, you know, I can, I can scream about seizing the, the, the old mantra of seizing the means of production. Uh, and I mean that, plan on that in, in every form or fashion. But ain't that many hardcore means for me to seize the dice. <laughs> like the productive capacity is just not there. So part of what we're doing is we're actually building up the productive forces, right? And then, so that's, that's the other part, but the piece is like, how do we do that within the ecological limits that exist? That's the, the real trick. So it's not production for production's sake. It has to be articulated from the top around how do we create things based upon the actual need within our community, right? So a use-based form of production not a commodity-based form of production, right? Critical shift that we've been talking about, and all of us who study any kind of part, March, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But how we, how there are certain things that enable us to kind of move to that on a particular level, and that's, gets to the fourth component on that thing, which is community production, right? And this is something that we picked up primarily from uh, an organization called Insight Focus, if folks want to look at it. Uh, uh, based out of, uh, right now, primarily out of Idaho, but you know, also based in Detroit. And this is taken, some of y'all might be familiar with the old CNC, Computer Numeric, what was it called? Uh, computer Numeric Program, whatever it was. You know, but now they call it like digital fabrication. 
and the digital fabrication, that kind of revolution, you know, uh, uh, Blair, I would argue, and I believe, you know, it's kind of like at this 1.5 version, but it's growing exponentially. And we have a, an article in the book, you know, which is called like, you know, eliminating the fabrication divide. Being very conscious about black folks kind of got excluded from the, the, the first kind of digital divide. Then being clear, we want to enter into this now so that we can develop appropriate technology, because we're not technology folks, I'm not, for sure, right? Uh, uh, and I was very reluctant at first around even kind of thinking this particular way, because I, you know, one of the questions I was sitting down with Blair, I was like, look, uh, what I see with all this kind of form of automation is uh, more and more, more need to eliminate black labor. So that's a direct threat to me. Like, I, you know, I'm, with that short of revolution, I need my folks to have jobs. And this is a particular way to eliminate jobs. He's like, I understand why you think about it that way, but think about it this way instead. Right? You know, we, we community own this in places we know are keenly, you know, underdeveloped and their jobs are not returning to Detroit in the same way that they were in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I know that you know that. This is a place that we can, a space that we can occupy that builds our productive capacity in a, in a way that's not based upon commodity production. It's our soul. Right, particularly after seeing what they were doing, like, okay, we need that. We brought it, and I would say that this is a component that we need to add fundamentally to all our work. So all this has to come together democratically and be involved. And the way in which there's two things that didn't have to be described. And so we call these, these, these practices I'm outlining within the Build and Fight formula. That there, this is borrowed from Gramsci. There's the practices of position, and then there's the practices of maneuver. What I'm describing are like the practices and methodologies of uh, position, like putting ourselves in a position to be able to fight back. In. But there's another component of this, which we know is real, just if the right was not, of the far right was not on the advance, you would still need this. Because if you get to a point uh, where workers are, you know, taking over factories one way or another, buying them, taking them, occupying, whatever the situation, if you get to that particular point, as we are now experiencing Jackson, the empire is going to strike back. They're not going to sit there and just let us move how we want to move because this all sounds nice and pretty. Like they're going to fight back, right? And they're going to move back. So at some point, you got to be, be prepared to do the level of democratic, you know, uh, 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 work with a clear sense of community self-defense baked into it. And those are the last two practices within this formula that we really want to articulate. And what this is asking for, uh, again, if you look at most of this, there's millions of people already doing this. That's the key point. It's not like we're asking people to like, in, in many respects to adopt something particularly new. Like most everybody here works for a wage, right? If you're not retired, then you did work for a wage. Right, so you're already involved in it. There's already a side of struggle that you are involved in that just needs to be shifted and organized in a profoundly different way. Right? So that's convincing of your co-workers to move in this particular way. But it's not like you're asking them to like move to Mars. It's like, no, we need to do what we're doing to find a different, what has some different outcomes. So we start with the material basis and then have to figure out how do we connect all this so we have collective power in aggregating. Right? And for that, we need like people's assemblies on a broad level that are not just like novelty, let's get together and, you know, uh, just talk politics, whatever the situation. Like, no, how do we start actually making decisions if we're engaged in all of these practices? How do we start making decisions around what do we produce? You know, uh, who needs it? Who needs it the most? How do we deal with the real housing questions? You know, if there's a, like a shortage, but there's some extra capacity someplace else, do we feel like we can organize ourselves to basically maybe occupy that and convert it in a particular way? So you start really dealing with concrete, material, political <laughs> questions. And the other piece of which I'll end on, trying to incorporate this in such a manner that the ideological diversity that we have doesn't have to be surrendered. Like, that's the core piece of what we're trying to articulate with this, and why we're saying it's more of a formula. Like, I'm not trying to convince the anarchists not being anarchists no more. I'm, I don't, like can we agree upon doing some, some things together for some concrete political objectives? And I actually need some of the tools from your tradition to correct some of the mistakes from mine. Right? And if we're doing enough things collectively together, 
we wind up creating, you know, a, 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 a set of practices that deal with our current material reality that enable us to move forward and create some new thought and new practices. And this is based upon this notion that basically it's, it's easier to act our way into new ways of thinking than it is to think our way into new ways of acting. So I'm in there. Thank you.